Um, let's stand together. We're going to read John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. It should come up on the screen. Will it come up on the screen? If not, open your Bibles and I will read and you will follow. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii, that's nine months of wages, worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered, the, gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the barley loaves left by those who had eaten the five barley loaves. When the people saw this sign what that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to be made king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Lord, we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to shine upon this page. Lord, would you make the miracle of preaching happen this morning, where you speak to us from the Bible through a human being. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, moms and dads and boys and girls, um, we try always to be timely. We may go a little extra today. So boys and girls, help your parents pay attention, please. Okay? Make sure they stay focused. In John chapter 6, and we're actually going to, by God's grace, go through the entire chapter this morning and feast upon it. John chapter 6 is the longest chapter in the New Testament, but it's only one story. And the story is the sermon that Jesus preaches. There's two miracles and one story. And the important thing is the story. Now remember, John's gospel is written, John chapter 20, verse 31. It's written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing in Jesus, we would have life in his name. Life bursts out of this book. The number one word people use to describe existence today is the word death. My feet are killing me. These french fries are to die for. So on and so forth. And yet here's a book that bursts with life. Jesus did not come to fulfill your or my earthly expectations. If you expect Jesus to do what he did not come to do then your made-up Jesus will cause you to be disappointed in the real Jesus. And you will walk away from the real Jesus, saying, I tried Christianity and it didn't work. In this chapter, the chapter begins with a crowd of 5,000 men, so add women and children, maybe 20,000 people, and ends with 12 We're on a pastor search here at this church for an associate pastor. You would not hire Jesus based on this chapter. Tell us about your last evangelistic effort, Jesus. Well, I began the day with 5,000. Well, and how did it go? 
Well, I ended the day with 12. Well, I'm sorry, you're not on our short list. The word believe happens in this chapter eight times. The word life happens 12 times. The word give or gives happens seven times. And it's all God doing the giving. It's a glorious chapter. Now, yes, Jesus cares about every detail of your life. He care you can pray about anything and everything in your life. Jesus cares. But he will not serve your agenda. He has come not to make you better, but new to save you from your sins and, and fix you for eternity. And in this, in this chapter, the crowd wants a king, and Jesus won't be their king. Jesus will not serve their present agenda, their temporal needs. He says all through this chapter, I've come for eternity. I've come for life. I've come to give my life for you. So we start with scene one. And by the way, there are wonderful Bible helps for the children and the adults this morning. And the best thing you can do with these moms and dads and boys and girls is make sure you go home with these. And then take some time and moms and dads sit down with your, with your kids and go through this. Okay. The preaching of the Bible is not meant to replace the duty of parents to instruct their children. Okay? Just a supplement. We're just, we're laying a table, that's all. Scene one, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Here we have it in John chapter six. We read it. And there's four things in scene one. Number one, a big crowd. 5,000 men, probably 20,000 people. Notice when you read the Gospels that the crowds are always wrong. Always. They always misunderstand Jesus and the purpose of Jesus. And they inevitably are only thinking about this life right now. It is the great challenge of preaching to lift our sights to God and to eternity. If you and I will learn to think in terms of eternity, we will live in time much better. There's a big crowd. Secondly, there's a big need. There's not food for this crowd. Philip says, nine months wages couldn't feed this company of people. It's a big crowd. There's a big need. Third thing, there's a little boy. There's a little boy in this chapter. And children, something's going to happen in this chapter because of a little boy who simply brought his lunch to Jesus. And says to Jesus, Andrew brings this little boy to Jesus. Now this little boy could have said, you're not having my lunch. But he didn't. He gave his lunch to Jesus. Said, Jesus, I don't know what you can do, but you can do something with it. There's a beautiful, beautiful lesson for all of us taught by a little boy. And that lesson, and it, it goes right down to the Senga people. Lord, what, what can you do? Westbrook Church, the whole people group in Zambia, what can you do with us? Well, we'll give you what we have. The lesson of the little boy in this miracle is give Jesus what you have. And stop making excuses. And see what Jesus does. He gives Jesus five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Can you imagine that little boy when, when he went home at the end of the day and his mother said, how was your lunch? <laughs> Mom, you won't believe what happened with my lunch today. A man named Jesus took it. And I just want to say to you this morning... Whether you're eight years old like this little boy, or maybe you're 70 years old and retired, maybe you're sick or infirm, or you're busy with kids, whatever. Whatever you are, whoever you are, give yourself wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, do what you will with me. Amen? And just see what he does. 
and pray again what David Brainerd pray, prayed, the, the little missionary to Indians who died at the age of 27, but he prayed, Lord, use me in a way totally disproportionate to who I am. Just give yourself to the Lord. This little boy gives Jesus the, the little lunch that he has. Jesus takes it, verse 11, gives thanks and distributes it to everyone. Big crowd, big need, little boy, big miracle. And everybody feasts upon this bread so much so that there are 12 basketfuls left over. Super abundance, just like the changing of the water into wine way back when, John chapter 2. Super abundance, not just a paltry amount, but an abundant amount. This is a creation miracle. Effectively, Jesus made much out of nothing. It's a sign of his divinity. Now, immediately, the people want to make him king. This is indeed the prophet. Moses said a great prophet would come. This is indeed the prophet who's come into the world and perceiving they were about to take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew. Do you see here the people had an agenda for Jesus? This is the man who will meet our earthly needs. Now, I don't know why you've come to church here this morning. You may have come for wonderful motives or silly motives. You may have come because you want Jesus to meet some earthly agenda of yours. I have to tell you the truth. One of the reasons I started going to church when I was 18 years old was to meet a girl. And I did. She's sitting right there. But Jesus has said no to most of my prayers. I would say 95% of my prayers, Jesus has said no to. That prayer will damage you. That prayer is simply about this little life you're living, John. Now, he cares about this little life. But most of my prayers have been selfish and foolish, short-sighted. Jesus has said, no, here's the crowd. Jesus, be our king. Jesus says, no. I have not come to establish an earthly kingdom. And he withdraws and goes up on a mountain to pray. And he says to his disciples, let's get out of here. Get in a boat and get across this lake. You're not going to be my cabinet members, and I'm not going to be the king. So he disappoints the needs of the crowd. So, scene two. He's up on a mountain praying. The disciples are in a boat in a storm. Now, by the way, the miracle of the loaves, all four gospels talk about that. And here's the miracle on the lake, and the other gospels talk about this too. And Mark tells us, Mark tells us that when Jesus was way up on the mountain... And they were miles away at the sea. He saw them. Supernatural. And here's a picture of how Jesus treats his church. He sees the church in trouble. He goes to the church in trouble. He gets into the church and takes it with him to the desired haven. There's a whole, for those of you who like these things, a whole picture of church history there and eschatology right there in this miracle. Talk about that later if you'd like. Job says in chapter 9, verse 8, he treads upon the waves upon the sea. This is God. The disciples are in a boat and Jesus walks on water to them because he's the Lord of water. And he is the Lord of nature. And he is the Lord of all. And he gets into the boat and immediately they are on the other side of the lake. Supernatural miracle. That's scene two. So we've had two very fast miracles. The reason why we're not dwelling on them is because the sermon Jesus preaches, scene three, is the important thing in this chapter. Now, I've always found it helpful to bring a Bible to church with me. And I hope that you have brought a Bible. 
If you haven't brought a Bible, it's good to start bringing one. And if you're like me, for many, many years, I trusted my wife to bring the Bible. Moms and dads, dads, bring a Bible to church. You may have it on your phone. I understand that. I'm not going to contest that with you, really. But I am going to say this. There's nothing like handing a good old worn out Bible to your grandkids one day and said, this is what I lived. This is what I followed Jesus with. You're probably not going to hand them your phone one day and say, this was the phone I used for all of my devotionals. No, bring a Bible and wear it out. So we're in chapter six now. The miracle of the loaves, the miracle on the sea. Now, the disciples have crossed back across the Sea of Galilee from Gentile territory back to Capernaum, Jewish territory, and the crowd has run all the way around the lake to meet them there. We're going to pick up with verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw, saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, how did you get here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, verse 26, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs proving that I'm your Messiah, but because you ate bread. So I want you to see how Jesus welcomed this crowd. Here's this huge crowd. And Jesus did not say, oh, I've got them right where I want them. My movement is going well. I'm going to manipulate these people. And I'm going to become the greatest religious showman that ever lived. None of that. Jesus looks right at the crowd and he says to them, you're not here because you think I'm your Messiah. You're here simply because I met your temporal needs. I gave you what you wanted yesterday, and so you followed me here today. Look what he says in verse 27. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So he's taking this crowd, and he's saying, I want to lift your vision above the moment and to eternity. <clears throat> That's one of the jobs of coming to church. Chad helps us with music. We help it with praying. We help it with preaching. Because all week long, we've probably been too involved in the things of this world. All of us. And we need to come here and be reminded of eternity. And Jesus says, don't work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which I will give you, for on him God has set his seal. Now look at verse 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to, the, to do the works of God? Every religion on earth seeks to answer that question. Question. What does God want me to do to keep him happy? Every religion asks that question. But look at the answer Jesus is going to give. Jesus is going to give the most astounding answer. And in his sermon, Jesus is going to say four things about himself in the rest of John chapter 6 that we need to get and understand. And here's the first thing he's going to say, and it's in answer to the question they ask, what must we do to please God? Look at verse 29. This is the answer Jesus gave them. The work of God is that you believe in him whom he has sent. The only thing God requires of a sinner is to believe in Jesus. Look at verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes 
has eternal life. Now, you cannot get a more succinct or simple presentation of the gospel than that. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Now, wait a minute. Stop just a moment. To believe in Jesus means you stop believing in everything else. It's not an easy or cheap thing to believe in Jesus. In many countries in the world today, if you believe in Jesus, it will cost you your life. It's not cheap. It's not casual. It is submitting to him as Lord. Matter of fact, we have a de definition for belief. Maybe we can get the slide up. <coughs> to be convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and to trust him as Lord and Savior. But do you get what Jesus is saying about himself here? He's saying of all the religions in the whole world, line them all up with all their leaders and all their books and all their teachings and all their ceremonies and everything that they do and put me over here. And if you want to do what God is asking of you, what God is asking of you is one simple, profound thing. Stop believing in all that. And believe in me. Exclusively. As the son of God. As the savior of sinners. As the Lord of eternity. No matter what it costs you. So when someone says to you, well, if you believe in Jesus, then I won't be your girlfriend or boyfriend anymore. It'll cost you that. If someone says, well, if you believe in Jesus, then you may not prosper in your career. It'll cost you that. <coughs> if someone says, well, if you believe in Jesus, then you'll get hounded out of your particular university class or your particular society. It'll cost you that. But it's all God is asking of you. He's not asking of you or of me that we do anything. He's asking that we come humbly and believe in Jesus. Jesus said, the work that God requires is that you believe in me. That's good news. It delivers us from religion. It delivers us from us. Look at the next thing he says. We're going to go all the way down. Now, it's, it's very interesting. The, disciples say, or the, the crowd says, all right, well, give us a sign to prove we should believe in you. Hang on a minute. What was it about the bread that you didn't get yesterday? If you are constantly looking for a sign, you'll never get enough. This is what they say to Jesus. You know, Jesus, all right, we know you fed us bread yesterday. We get that. But, you know, Moses fed Israel bread for 40 years, Jesus. So what are you going to do for us today? And Jesus comes right out and he says, Moses didn't feed you that bread. God did. And I am the true bread that's come down from heaven. You can read it there. Up to verse 34. But some of us are always looking for a sign. Some of us are never convinced that just Jesus loves us, died on a cross for our sins, and is inviting us into life with him. We always have to have some sort of new proof. And I'll tell you, if you are sign-oriented, you'll never get enough. Jesus said it's a wicked generation that demands a sign. But look what Jesus says in verse 35. Now, he's just fed them bread. They've just asked for more bread. Jesus says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. This is the second astounding thing Jesus says about himself in John chapter 6. The first one is, believe in me and you'll have eternal life. That's all God's asking of you. The second one is, I'm the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Now, we have to stop there for a moment. Bread meant something very different to this crowd than it does to you and me. These days, and in our culture, we can take bread or leave bread. Maybe some of you are saying, well, I can't relate to this. I'm gluten-free. <laughs> Jesus, you're not speaking my language here. 
in our culture, you can say, well, you know, I'll have rice instead of bread. Or I'll have pizza. Or I'll have this. In this culture, people trusted in bread to keep them alive. It was bread or nothing. It was bread or death. It was bread or starvation. There wasn't Wendy's over here and Burger King over there, and it wasn't a buffet. You either feed, Jesus is saying here, you either come to me or you're done. Jesus is saying something profoundly exclusive about himself. When he says, I am the bread of life, he is saying, it is me or nothing. Eat me or starve. That's what Jesus is saying there. Now, by the way, this is the first of seven amazing I am statements in John's gospel. We'll say them quickly, and then maybe you can talk about them later and see how many you can remember. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. He's going to say these seven amazing things about himself in this gospel. So I've just said them to you quickly. It'd be a good exercise on the way home to say, how many of those can we remember? But here's the first. And when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's saying something profound about himself. The third amazing thing he says is in verse 37 to 40, and that's this. I will not lose one person that the Father gives me. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Do you see both election and free will in that verse? I do. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That's election. And whoever comes to me, that's me coming to Jesus. I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Look at verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last day. Do you see what Jesus is saying about himself there and how it relates to you? Anyone that the Father gives me, I will never drive them away. And how do you know if the Father has given you to the Son? Well, you've come to him. You've come to him. And he says, the Father's will is that I will lose none. None. Of all that he's given to me. Let me tell you why I, why I feel absolutely secure as a believer. I want to tell you, and I really want you to hear this. It is not because I love Jesus. I do love him, by the way. But my love for Jesus wouldn't be worth a postcard. It's not because Jesus loves me. Jesus does love me. And his love for me would be worth volumes. I am secure because Jesus loves his father. You've got to see that in verse 38 and 39. You have to see it there. Jesus has promised his father that he will not lose one that he has given him. I am secure. Because Jesus promised his father he would keep me. Not because of me. It's as though the father said to the son, all right, son, brace yourself. I'm giving you John Gillespie. You're going to atone for his sins on the cross. And it's as though Jesus said, anybody but him, father? He's the most arrogant, the most difficult, one of the, one of the thickest. But, Father, if you give him to me, because I love you, Father, I promise you, I will never lose him. Do you see that in verse 39? 
If you see it in verse 39, please help me. Please say, I see it in verse 39. Can you see it? There's a covenant between the Father and the Son. Dennis preached about this last week. There's a covenant between the Father and the Son of which we are the beneficiaries. And that's where the security of the believer lies. And the fourth amazing thing Jesus says about himself is that as a hungry person eats bread, so we must eat Jesus. In verses 51 to 58, ten times Jesus says we must eat him, drink his blood, feed upon him if we are to have life. Now, he's not instituting communion here. That wouldn't happen for two more years. He's talking about what faith is like. Look at verse 51. The bread that I give, that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He's going to give himself for the life of the world. And we respond to that by feeding upon him by faith. Just like a hungry person eats bread, so a needy sinner takes on board Christ through faith. It is not passive, it is active. Salvation is a personal reliance upon Jesus. It's right here in this passage. Jesus says, verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, has, not will have, has. What's the difference between has and will have? One's present, isn't it? One's future. Has eternal life. And I will raise him up. That's future. On the last day. Seven times in this passage, Jesus says the Father gives me to the world. He gives me. It's the glorious heart of of God. Now, in order to feed on Christ, you must be hungry for Jesus. He can't spoil your appetite on all sorts of other things. Children, do you spoil your appetite sometimes? Your mom's made a beautiful meal for you, and you sit down and you pick at it. And your mom says, what's going on? Then the truth comes out. You've been in the cookies. And you have no appetite. Some of us have no appetite for Jesus because we're filling our stomachs with foolishness, our souls. You must be hungry for Jesus. You must recruit, receive Christ by faith. You must delight in Christ and savor his goodness so that he will nourish your soul. All Jesus is doing here is using a graphic word picture to show us what faith is like. It's like eating bread. Scene four, the challenge. Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard state saying, who can listen to it? Not hard to understand, just hard to receive. You mean to tell me you're not going to be my king? You need to t mean to tell me you're not going to make sure I'm healthy and prosperous and I get my best life now? That's not why you came, Jesus? Jesus, all you've been talking about is heaven and eternity and the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. We want a king right now. But Jesus, knowing this in himself, says, why are you grumbling? Verse 64, there are some of you who do not believe. This is why I told you, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. By the way, to humble people, Jesus always said, just come. To proud people, Jesus said, you can't come unless the Father draws you. Very interesting. Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And Jesus did not run after them and say, hang on, hang on, hang on. I didn't mean it. Didn't mean it. I've got another way. I'll lower my standards. You can have me and some other stuff too. No, he let the crowd go. He let the crowd go. A pastor once said to me, uh, we're having a problem with our building. We have too many people coming. We need to build a bigger, build a bigger b building. And I said, no, you just need to preach repentance. That will solve the crowd problem. And Jesus looks at his disciples. He looks at his disciples and says, do you want to go too? 
If all you're into is an earthly king who's going to give you everything you want, like Pedro in, what was the movie again? Napoleon Dynamite. Vote for me and all your wildest dreams will come true. I give one movie reference in three years and I can't remember the movie. Look what Peter says. Look what Peter says in verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. 5,000 people have just left. The disciples must have started the day thinking our movement is unstoppable. They end the day with just Jesus. And their confession is beautiful. And I ask you this question. I ask you this where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to find a message of grace? Where else are you going to discover that your sins have been atoned for, placed upon another? Where else are you going to find? Muhammad didn't die for your sins. Buddha didn't die for your sins. Where else are you going to go? Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. The crowd didn't want the words of eternal life. They wanted a king to give them bread. Peter got it. I think it'd be a good idea on the way home to talk in the car with each other. Where else would we go? For all the difficulty of believing in Jesus, where else would we go? Talk about it. You can't come up with a better option than Christ. But I can't quite finish yet. I, please, want, give me two more minutes. Peter said too much. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe that you... He was speaking for all of them, you see. He was speaking for all of them. And Jesus said, wait a minute, one of you is a devil. That's very significant. I cannot believe for you. Your mom and dad cannot believe for you. It's as though Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I receive your confession, but you've said more than you have authority to say. You're not the first pope, Peter. You cannot speak on behalf of the church. There's one here who doesn't believe that I have the words of eternal life. And there might be a husband here today who's thinking, I'll get to heaven by virtue of my wife's faith. No, you won't. There's a child here today who might say, well, I'll get to heaven by, by virtue of my parents' faith. No, you won't. Someone else might say, well, I go to Westbrook. I'm good. No, you aren't. No, you're not. Jesus said in so many words to Peter, Peter, you can't speak for everybody. You can speak for yourself. So I ask you personally, I ask you personally, do you confess that Jesus has the words of eternal life? And do you know in your heart that there's no other place you could go but Christ? Do not put any hope in false. You are not saved because you come to this church or because your parents were Christians or because your mother played the organ or your grandmother. You're saved because you get to a place where you say, Jesus, I have no hope but you. And you will discover there a willing and a ready Savior. Let's stand together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this chapter. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've said no to so many of our prayers. They were foolish. They were time-bound. They would not have helped us. And you care to save us. You are wonderful. Lord, we want to say with Peter, Lord, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe that you are the Holy 
one of God. Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit to bring this word to life in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.